All right, this is the Noir Hour, and I am Tyler from October Noir, and I'm here with Christopher Dahman of Dahman and Dahman and the Oz Tones. Chris, once again, how are we doing, man? We're doing good. We're uh, kicking into gear here. Yeah, we had a little technical <laughs> difficulty at first. All good, yeah. <laughs> anyway, um, man, I wanted to kind of, first of all, I'm so glad that you're here with me. Um, man, you know, playing the music and listening to the music that I have over the years, I've met so many people that are in love with Domin and the music and just the whole vibe. And I've been in love with Domin ever since I took a trip, and this is before GPS on your phone, you know. I had a little Garmin that was oh, the Garmin, three years yeah. outdated. I thought you were going to tell me you're using the Thomas guide. No, the I had the I had the Garmin that I hadn't plugged up to a computer uh, in uh-huh. three or four years. So I took a trip from Mobile, Alabama to Atlanta and saw you guys with him in 2010. And that, that was a cool venue, I remember. It was, what, what was the venue of that? For that? Cent- center stage. Yeah, it sort of had like a theater type yeah. setting, wasn't it? Yeah. yeah, and it was totally sold out. Yeah, um, that was a cool, that was a very cool venue. I, I liked playing there. Yeah, the so I've told this story to a couple of friends of mine, but right before you guys went on, I had never heard Domin. Uh, mm-hmm. But I downloaded, well, I bought y'all stuff on iTunes and put it on my iPod to listen on the way up, and I didn't listen to it at all because I was stoked on him. Mm-hmm. Um, and there was this girl that cut in front of all of us. She's like, look, I'm just here to see Domin. I'm just here to see Domin. Can I just please get in front of y'all? And when they're done, I'm leaving. And sure enough, we let her cut. And when y'all left, she hauled ass. So I'm guessing <laughs> that she went to find you guys. Huh. But that was my first impression of Domin is somebody cutting in and missing the bands after missing him just come to see you guys and shot out of there. So that's flattering. That's cool. I mean, yeah, you know, so, it's, it says something that we, you know, we're uh, doing something right, I guess. Yeah. So the whole way back we were blasting love is gone over and over and over. And that's been the case for the past almost 15 years in my, uh, in my book. So that's cool. Awesome. I'm glad it hasn't gotten old. <laughs> yeah yeah i kind of wanted to wait to tell that story but it, it's just i mean that was my first impression of the band and of you and the guys so yeah. that's a lasting thing and i know there, there's a poster back there it's hard to see but i met you guys back i met you guys in atlanta and it was mm-hmm. just awesome because that was 2010 so i was 21 uh 20 maybe and I, you know, I had these big, these big, this big imagination of all, you know, I was in a thrash metal band. I'm like, yeah, I'm going to, I'm going to be this and be that. And is it, you know, and I always thought about opening bands as, you know, they're, they're on their way up or they're not there, you know, but I I always wanted to be an opening band. I'm like, man, that's got to be the coolest, but to, to meet you guys back then and then to hear the music on, in the live show, it was, uh, something special. So. Well, thank you. Um, I, I actually really enjoyed being a support band um, because, I don't know, it was just one of those things, like the, the sets were short and everything, but you know, Dahman didn't play a lot of headlining. We didn't get, really get the chance to do a lot of headlining shows. We did, most of the headlining shows we did were sort of ways to route us back home after the end of whatever tour it was on. So yeah. if the tour like ended in New York, then they'd be like, okay, well, let's get you a headline in Philly and then Chicago and then, you know, it's like somewhere in Arizona. And it's like just kind of trekking back back to California. Yeah. Um, but I actually really enjoyed being the opening band because I liked, I, I really enjoyed the, the process of seeing people with, you know, who this is this, they suck, can't wait for my favorite band to come on. To all of a sudden, like, you know, midway to the set, okay, all right, cool. And then, like, and then seeing him, like, at the merch booth buying a CD or something. You yeah. know what I mean? Like, that was just, I like the process of, like, you know, the conversion of not a fan to, to you know, full-blown, like, I came here for this band, but I'm now, you know, I'm now glad I saw you guys, or now I'm a fan of you guys, or yeah, 
you know, that was, that was always super cool. And, and I always sort of liked the challenge of having to like prove myself to be like, okay, people, you know, let me show you what we can do, you know, kind of thing. Yeah. Like, well, I mean, that know, was, yeah. it wasn't like, you know, it's not supposed to be a competition. Like in some ways it's not because you're on the road with people and you like everybody and everyone's having fun usually. Um, right. And so you, you, you're always just like supporting every, each other and that kind of thing. But there is like a competitive aspect where you want to go, okay, I'm going to turn all of you in the audience into fans, you know, into supporters, or at least, you know, play my heart out and hope that you connect kind of thing. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, well, yeah. I mean, I was one of those, I was one of those kids out there. I'm like, man, who the hell is this? You know? And, yeah. but then by the third song, I'm like, holy shit, what am I, what am I witnessing right now? And that, and that's rare. That's pretty rare. Like, let's be honest. I mean, to see open to see bands that are opening for you know they're on tour with this band and they're opening up it's pretty rare to see a band that's just that just blows you away and sticks with you and i think yeah, that that's i, I, I kind of think it doesn't happen very many times with me either like bands that i've gone and seen i've yeah. sort of not really been impressed with the openers for the most part yeah but i kind of think that you say you like being an open band but what what could be better than going on tour with him or 69 eyes or lacuna coil and um even with like you guys doing the 69 eyes with the becoming tours and stuff. I mean, that, that, that style of music caters to all those opening bands. So it's kind of perfect. I mean, it catered to me because I'm like, Holy yeah. shit, man, this, these guys are new and I never heard them. And why haven't I heard them? And then that kind of leads you down the path of fandom, you know? Well, I mean, that's, that's sort of a testament to um, like the booking agents and the people putting that together because there have been times where I've gone, I mean, on one hand, I know people used to talk about shows like back in the 70s and stuff like that, where you'd see very different bands. And there's something very cool about that. Yeah. But um, I have to say, we've got, we were pretty lucky in terms of being on bills where if you're a fan of one band, you're likely to be a fan of the other. And I've, and I've seen plenty of shows where that wasn't the case. Yeah. You know, where you go to see a band and like, particularly like, I just remember seeing, you know, when, when I go watch like Typo or something. And they were on some very interesting tours that was just like, I'm not a fan. Like, I don't know why this band's on tour with this band, you know, but it was sort of, they, they in a lot of ways got lumped in with a lot of like super, like, I don't know, hardcore metal stuff, even though that, that was sort of in their background, the music that they were playing at the time like wasn't like that. So it was always sort of weird because you'd have, you know, these real like, you know, thrash metal heads or something. Yeah. Well, it was sort of a, a weird mix, but um, but yeah, like we we got lucky in terms of that. It was very, there were very cool bills. I love the becoming. I mean, I wish I I still listen to that record, the album that they put out. Um, yeah, I, I I put that on every once in a while and stuff, and I think it's a fantastic, fantastic album. Yeah, I put yeah, I that that record is a masterpiece. I put it beside Love Is Gone on the shrine of just incredible like perfection albums. Um. Yeah, it's cool. And it's cool. I mean, I always felt a real cool connection with them because I felt like they were sort of in the same place we were. Like we were both sort of just doing the, you know, the road dog thing, and you know, trying yeah. to just get every opportunity we could. And uh, yeah, that was. They're a cool band. They're cool, cool guys in that band. Yeah, shout out Dustin Lowry, man. Appreciate yeah. you. But yeah, Justin so Justin and Corey and Caleb, and when we were playing with them, they had like. I can't remember who the drummer was at the time, but then they've gone through a few different drummers. Yeah, have you listened to any of Caleb's solo stuff? Yeah, yeah, it's cool. He's got his own like kind of blues blues rock thing going on, and yeah, it's like it's like he's gotten some pretty cool tours as well. Yeah, yeah, it's like alt country blues or something. That's mm -hmm. it's unique, but yeah, it's very cool. But yeah, but bands like Typo, I mean, there was no band, there was no band like Typo Negative then. I mean, there's just they were on an island on their own. So they did yeah. pick up a lot of crazy shows, but you know, like even the typo Pantera tour didn't seem, you know, I mean, as a fan, you would love to see it cause you get, cause that's what you're getting. But, uh, style wise, not, not really in the same yeah. boat at all. Well, that was, it was one of those things where it's like, I mean, I guess, I mean, I, I saw them on the Pantera tour. I was like front row in front of this, you know, when they were playing pranks on each other and stuff. Yeah. Um, to me, that was typo at their like at the highlight of that at their height um, that tour. But I actually enjoyed it because I'm a I was a Pantera fan too, so it was 
awesome to see that. So it worked for me, but that was sort of, um, well, here's another one. Like I saw them open for, like I'm a huge Danzig fan, at least like the first four or five Danzig records. Right. And um, the uh, they were on tour with, it was, they were opening for Danzig and they got booed so hard. <laughs> and it was just like, and for me, that was the perfect billing because at the time, those were my two favorite bands. I got to see Typo with Danzig and that was like, one of my favorite shows I'd ever been to it was out at a place called, or it used to be called the Ir Irvine Meadows out here. Um, it was on Halloween night. And um, yeah, and they just got, like the crowd was not respectful. And I was just, I, and you know, and it was one of those things where, you know, you kind of had those metal meatheads where they're just like, oh, there's keyboards in it. You know, we don't yeah. like it kind of thing. And I was like, oh, yuck. <laughs> yeah, that, that seems kind of, kind of insane in retrospect to me yeah it's, it's silly <clears throat> but um well look let, let i want to talk about i want to hear a little about a bit of a little bit about the beginnings of domin i mean because obviously now we know that there was men your misery and i don't yeah. know how bit i don't know how mainstream that was if it was just a demo um but men your misery was first like tell me a little bit about the beginnings of domin because from where I sit, all I saw was Domin's on tour with him. I just saw Domin. I've got the album. I met the guys. Holy shit, this is something special. Um, so Domin was initially it was a solo side project for that was separate from the rock band that I was in. Um it was they were both my like projects, but the name Domin was more associated with, um, with like an electronic side project. I was, I'm, I'm a huge like Depeche Mode fan as well, and it was more of like, you know. So I did some, and I was just learning how to record myself at home, um, kind of thing. And so I was sort of making these demo songs and stuff. But when I would go in with my band, we'd go in and perform. You know, like as a rock band, we'd have to go into a studio and do it properly, and because I didn't know anything about recording myself back then um and so when i the way it sort of all started was you know i had, i was sort of playing in everything that i could because my whole thing was like man i just want to be able to make a living in music i want to be able to play my songs like even if i wasn't playing my songs i was happy to join anybody's band yeah and and i'm still like that today like if somebody was like hey i need a guitar player i'm happy to jump on stage and be their guitar player like i just think um you know, musicians and people that love music, you just need to be willing to play with whoever, you know, unless, unless you like hate the music or something. Right. Um, but I think, you, but even then, it's just like you play and meet people and, and that kind of thing. And so I was just sort of at the time kind of playing and doing all sorts of things. Well, one of the bands that I had joined um, had, an, had, it was like a, it was kind of like an all girl band, but there were two dudes in it. It was me and the other guitar player. And it was that guy that showed my demo of my rock band to um, Lucas Banker, who is a producer. He works with Logan Mater. They were like a producer team at the time. And they were um, producing stuff like, um, I think they were doing Fear Factory and Silent Civilian and a bunch of like pretty heavy metal bands and stuff. And Lucas was a big fan of Danzig and Typo and those kinds of bands. And he heard my demo and was like, oh, shoot, let's you know, let's work together. So, you know, I remember being at my day job and him calling me up and being like, we should do something together. And he being a little skeptical, but just being like, okay, well, let's see where this goes. And it was through my relationship with that producer team that we made Men Your Misery. We did basically, we did, Men Your Misery happened in like two separate um, studio sessions. First, we did five songs first, which I think was My Higher Hands, Next Day Apologies, Tonight, I can't think of the other two, but it was five songs. And after we did those five, it was like, that was like in August. And then in January, we're like, well, let's do another six. We're like, well, let's just put it all together and put out an album. And yeah. So we, we did that. We put together, you know, the, what is the Men Your Misery album. And then sort of right from there, that's when sort of um, the producers were sort of shopping it around and showing it to, you know, this person at this label, showing it to this person at that label. And eventually it was Roadrunner that, you know, was the most active with their interest and came out and saw us and, you know, that kind of thing. So when we came time to do the Love is Gone album, 
it was like, well, men your misery sort of only existed within like MySpace, really. Right. It was like unless you were at one of our local shows in LA or you know, I don't even remember if we sold them online. I must, we must have, yeah, we must have sold them online because people had them around the country. So um, unless you were at an LA show where you bought the CD or you found it online through our MySpace account at the time, those, you know, I only, there was only a thousand printed of that. So and I still have like, you know, 10. And I'm just sort of keeping for who knows right. what, you know, for memories or whatever. So there's very, there's very limited printing of Men Your Misery out there. Um, and so when it came time to do the album, it was like, well, let's just sort of, you know, we don't want to be like, oh, we're going to just throw all those songs away and do all new songs. It was like, well, let's, you know, let's, now we have a bigger platform. Let's just sort of make Men Your Misery, you know, and switch out maybe a couple songs and then, you know, so that the album vibe is, you know, themed and consistent and good. And then let's add a few more. And that's what Love Is Gone became. So it was essentially Men Your Misery minus a couple songs and adding a few more adding a few others yeah yeah love is gone is like men your misery except it's polished to perfection and er, the yeah. whole album flows perfect so yeah so you know even a men your misery there's some interludes but i wanted to add some of those to kind of transition from song to song and um and yeah it has more of a a polished feel um but i mean it's funny like when i listen back I liked my guitar tones and all that stuff from the Men Your Misery album. I didn't really <laughs> like the Love Is Gone album. I sort of hate my guitar tone. It just sounds like there's, I don't know. Everything else sounds cool. <laughs> Drums and bass and, and all that, but uh, keyboards are what they are. But yeah, the guitar tone, I'm just like, oh, I wanted that Men yeah. Your Misery guitar tone. And I've been trying to chase that ever since. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that, that's funny. I was actually, I listened to them both back to back just the other day. You know, when we were planning to have a have a chat and I was going to I was going to kind of wonder, you know, because I just listen to them in passing or I'll throw the album on. And but, yeah, that the guitar was a little bit beefier. But as a whole, yeah, uh, Love is Gone just had that that punch. Yeah. So, yeah. For sure. So so the next album was Rise. Yeah. You know, uh, what I, I've always I've, I was always wondering, you know, uh I haven't ever heard super great things about Roadrunner. I don't think they're even around anymore, or if they are, I, I don't know much about them. But there seemed to be like a change in Domin from Love Is Going to Rise, and I don't know. I, it, it was just like maybe a little, just a little bit of change. Did that have anything to do with the label stuff? Um, partially, but also like you know, I if, personally, I, I don't really enjoy repeating myself um doing like you know the same thing over and over again oh, let me make another my heart your hands or something yeah. it's like you've got a my heart your hands let's do something else so when it came to rise part of the goal was to i almost wanted to make it so that it was like chapters in a book and so i kind of wanted to open you know i was like we opened up with this sort of heartbreak thing let me make an album that sort of has more of like a coming back to life type of thing you know so there was already that theme going for it which naturally was going to make it so that the songs weren't necessarily they were less dark and more like aggressive and so that was sort of the idea and then it was going to go and then with the next album i, I already had it like in my mind back then and the next album let me more go sort of the more you know a, a positive direction on love and relationships and things like that and, and that kind of thing um and so yeah there was a shift with the first album to the second album intentionally but also um like it's hard for me to listen to that album now because so much um uh, it was like the whole time was a mess and like we had recorded a full album and i wasn't 100 percent about where it was going and how it was turning out um but it was more than myself involved, you know? And I was trying to like, it's one of those things where you, you know, you, you want to lose your ego and you want to just go like, okay, well, maybe, maybe I'm wrong. So let me listen to this person that's sold a million records. Let me listen. Yeah. Maybe they know something I don't know. You know, you should got to be humble when you approach these things and be like, well, maybe, you know, maybe they got it figured out. Maybe they know better than I do. 
you know, because I can't tell you, I mean, how many stories have you heard of, you know, famous artists or whatever, and they hate the song that made their career? Right. You know, kind of thing. And it's just yeah. like, well, clearly they were wrong because that one worked. Right. So it's like, I didn't want to be that person. So it's like, okay, let me listen. And, and so, you know, the album, full album got made, but not mixed. And so at the time, Roadrunner went through a whole re reconstruction. And it was just, it was funny because it happened on the first day of our recording. So right. it was like, we were going into the studio in Hollywood. It was like first day of drums. Like drums is always first. So we had yeah. a nice studio we were going into. Drums was the first day. And I wake up in the morning. I'm like, all right, let's go. Day one in the studio, green light, let's go. And then it was like, um, I started seeing all these things on Facebook. Like all like the people that worked at the label, but were became friends over the years. Yeah. And so I was following the Facebook and I saw like all this stuff, like so sad. This is terrible. Blah, blah, blah. Like all this stuff. I'm like, what's going on? So I call one of my friends at the label and she, and um, she, you know, kind of tells me like, yeah, this whole thing is just like, gone to hell in a handbasket. <laughs> I'm like, uh oh, what does this mean for us? And so, you know, calling management, it's like, nah, talk to the label, everything's good. You go in, you do it. So we went in and we spent, you know, couple, like I was, you know, a few days on drums and then we did the guitars. And, you know, by, you know, after a month or two, the album was fully done. It was like, okay, well, now we need to mix it. And then, it, and then all of a sudden it became a like, we'll mix, you know, let's see how it's all going, mix a couple of the songs and send it to us so we can hear how it's going. So um, we had Joe Barisi, I don't know if you're familiar with who he is, but he's a producer who does, who's done like Queens of the Stone Age and Monster Magnet and you know, a bunch of huge records, but they're yeah. all like pretty gritty sounding. He's got, he's known for that raw kind of sound, which is what we were going for with Rise and more aggressive kind of thing. And um, so he he did a mix of, of the girls and, and one that's never been heard yet. And I can't be, think if he did a third one or not. But so he did it and sent it off to the label. And then we just didn't hear anything. And so we'd ask, you know, a lot of times they don't, labels don't necessarily want to speak to the artist directly, unless it's like the A&R and they're working out, you know, like the layout of your record or the album order or whatever it is. A lot of times they want just, they're speaking to the management and right. speaking to them because they don't, a lot of times the artists are too, you know, sensitive or emotional about it or, you know, not, whatever it is. So it was all this stuff, you know, I'm checking with management. Have we heard anything yet? What's going on? You know, and we just didn't hear anything. It's like, what the hell's happening over there? Like, are we, are we good? Or are we not good? And it was like that for months and months and months. And then after a while, it was like, okay, well, it's not, not going to happen, not moving forward. And so that was like 2012. And then Rise came out in 2015. So you got to think there's three years that passed between that. Yeah. Between when we recorded the album and when we put it out. When it came time to put, put it out, we were doing it independently. And I was like, well, if it's up to me now and I, you know, I'm not listening to anybody else. I, this song's not going on it. And this song's not going on it. So I started taking the songs off of it. Right. Okay. And I said, okay, well, and this song that got taken off of it, I want to put this one back on. Like it opens up with this song called Bees and Demons. That wasn't supposed to be on the album. And that one was a home demo recording and I, and I went to Joe Barisi who ended up doing such like a bro deal mix job on the, on Rise because to be honest the album was a mess it was like listening to it was like this oh. doesn't sound like I want it it doesn't like we, we need to save this because this is all we got and so we pinched our pennies to like pay Joe like the most reduced bro deal fee Right. And he just felt bad for us because he saw the whole thing happen. And he was like, man, I'll, you know, I'm sorry this happened to you guys. Like, obviously, I can't do it for free, but, you know, I'm, I want to help you out. So he hooked us up and he mixed the record. And but that was after, but I, from mixing the record, I, you know, I had these other songs get put on it that were like just demos. But I was like, I, but I want this song on. I can't afford to go in and re-record the drums and do their guitars and like i'm basically giving you my demo and saying please try to make this fit on the album yeah and so that's crazy so he did so so that so like when i listen back on it now like i can obviously hear the difference between these new demons and the girls it's like the girls is the best sounding song on the album because joe barisi took lots of time messing with it before it was like submitted to roadrunner and all the other ones were sort of just like 
thrown together as fast as possible. And some of them weren't even properly recorded. So when I listen back on that album, like, like I like, there's some moments I really love. Like I love falling into ashes. Yeah, that's my favorite one. And I love the quiet man. And then there's just other moments where I'm just like, and I think some of that's just due to the recording not translating the song as well as it could. Yeah. But uh, but yeah, it's sort of that that album's a mixed bag for me just because it's it's like there's so much from the recording to the mixing to the songs getting added to the other ones getting put off. It's just like it's a bit of a mess. Wow. So that's yeah. wild. That's wild how much hell you had to go through to get that out. I see. I wouldn't. I I don't think I've ever heard any that story as you just told it. Yeah, it's, you know, and it was, it was one of those things where it's like, okay, well, we haven't done anything. There's a bunch of fans out there who like Domin and they want to hear what's next. Let's, you know, and at the time, Pledge Music was the thing. Like, that's how you can raise money to yeah. bring your CDs and do all that. And, you know, that was the thing at the time. And I was like, okay, well, let's, let's try this. Let's see what happens. I don't know if anyone's going to care, you know? And so we, it was awesome because the first day of the Pledge thing, we hit our goal. Wow. It was like within two hours. And I was like thinking, no, oh, maybe over, you know, a month we'll raise enough money to, to you know, do everything that we need to do to, to finish the album. And it was like two hours, like boom. Oh, I was like, oh, crap, we got we got we need to put it out. That's crazy. I remember Pledge Music, but I mean, I'm a little bit younger. So back then I was just playing in the bars and just yeah. kind of having a good time. So I never really looked too far into Internet stuff to help my music at all i was just kind of doing it and kind of but yeah, i remember we, pledge yeah we did pledge for the third one too but i wouldn't do it again it was um i mean pledge and ended up falling like going out of business i think because they something bad happened with that I, I don't remember exactly what the story was but their money wasn't getting paid out or some shenanigans oh yeah um so that that whole company fell fell apart i think but um but yeah, you know, it was an case. interesting experiment, you know, to to try that and do that whole thing. But it was a it was a lot of work. Yeah, it was a lot of work. Yeah, man. What you know? So, what are your thoughts on what are your thoughts on music now? I mean, man, 2010. I feel like 2010 was the heyday of my existence. Just coming into life as like graduating high school and coming in and like really open it up and then finding all this great music that I still listen to today. It seems like everything was just so good back then. Mm -hmm. um, and musically, when I look at music today, man, it's just, it's tough. And, and now, yeah. and now you're, you know, you're in the studio, you're doing music and what are your thoughts on the industry right now? I mean, everybody's looking at Spotify numbers and numbers and the algorithms and, there's so much good that just, I mean, there's Domin fans all over the world that they don't even see Domin's Facebook. They don't see Domin on Instagram and it's not for not wanting to, it's just, it gets pushed down in the, in the metrics. I mean, yeah, it's that, that's a very complicated question. Um, because nothing's all good and all bad. You know, and it's yeah. it's funny that, that you mentioned 2010 because that's when we were on the road. And a lot, basically what changed in 2010, in my opinion, was that's when the iPhone came out. Or like it may have come out before that, but that was when it started to actually get popular, widely used. Yeah. I remember being on tour because I had a Blackberry. And I remember I, 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 needed something, I needed something that was international and had world, you know, connectivity and stuff. Yeah. And Blackberry was a thing. So I had a Blackberry. But Billy James, the bass player, had an iPhone. I was like, oh, that's cool. He was like, he was the Apple guy. He loved everything Apple. Yeah. So he had an iPhone. And so, you know, the, so that happened. But also at the same time, before the iPhone happened, before, which means that's, you know, even though there was MySpace and Facebook technically existed, it didn't exist in the same way that it does today. Yeah. Um, and so you still had, even though like sort of the download issue and all that stuff was hurting labels and stuff it was still the labels that were like the gatekeepers and the vetting so that you know the bands that you liked at the time and that you were going to see were all bands the labels were promoting it wasn't a band that you discovered because you were scrolling on instagram which right. i don't even know if existed at the time right so um there's something to say about labels vetting all the sort of 
crap that's coming in and going like, oh, this is all terrible, but this one's good and that one's good and that one's good. Let's put money behind that and show it to people. Um, so there's that aspect of it. Um, but also at the same time now with recording becoming easier and everybody's iPhone, you know, or Android or whatever they're using, having good quality cameras and yeah. social media being a thing, now there's no gatekeepers. And so now there's everything is out there and it's flooding the space and it makes it a lot harder to find good things. But I think that is sort of maybe why you think that 2010 was the, the highlight because there's probably bands out there that you would love and you just don't know they exist. Oh yeah. Never, never even heard of them at all. Yeah. You know, like there's, there's more bands and music and artists and songs being put out than ever in the history of the world. But you probably are never going to know. I know. You're never going to hear that song that you would die for. You know what I mean? You'll, you'll never know it exists. Yeah. Um, and that's just sort of the reality of, of the situation. And it's like, you know, and, and nowadays, you know, lab, labels still are effective. They, they can still, you know, because they got money and they can put you out there and do things. Um, so, you know, like on one hand, because, you know, I, before domin was signed like i was trying for a decade to do you know at least a decade to right. get make it happen you know and i was pissed off at the gatekeepers because they weren't letting my stuff through you know but yeah you know eventually when we got to the point where we we're ready and we knew the right people then it, then it all seemed to happen at the right time but you know so on that level like it's good that there's no gatekeepers because no one can tell you, no, you're not good enough or no, whatever it is. Because now the labels sort of, they don't need an A&R guy to go check out the band at the local club anymore. I'm sure some of them do, but by and large, they'll go, okay, let's just look at their Spotify stats. How many plays have they got? Uh -huh. You know, it's all just data driven. And it makes it so that they don't really have to work that hard because now they're just looking at stuff that's already successful and going, okay, we can help you be a little bit more successful. Right. You know, because we'll put some money in. So that's it's just sort of changed everything. But, you know, that that's the thing. It's like there's amazing bands out there. You know, you just have to it, for someone who's like a music lover that cares enough. You just actually have to go out there and, and look for it. Yeah. Yeah. I remember being I remember being um, I would go on Google all the time. Be like, what band sounds like this? What? And, and now people go to Reddit for that, I guess. And then burn people I've actually down. never been on reddit but i i hear it's crazy over there oh it is it is a uh it is a cesspool man it's where it's where your good feelings go to die it is just <laughs> it is something else man it, you're either getting people are absolutely loving something or they're absolutely hating hating everything so i hopped on reddit just just a little bit just to kind of scan the the landscape and i don't get on there too much yeah I mean, generally speaking, it's like it's the social media and all that and the internet in general, it's like, like, again, not all good, not all bad. There's amazing right. things on the internet. Like you can learn to do anything. You can type anything in YouTube and learn how to fix this and do that and learn this. Like all the knowledge of the world is at your fingertips now. But at the same time, it's such like what most people are using it for is just a time waste. Yeah. It's just looking at other people living their lives instead of you living your own life and so I, yeah and I, then comparing and hating yourself yeah yeah and then well that's the other thing too it's like there's always sort of like the common wisdom of the time especially with like music and stuff where it's like well now the thing is to release singles release a single every week or now the thing is to to do this on your instagram so that the algorithm blah 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 and there's been a couple times where i've done that kind of stuff and i go you know what? i'm just like i don't want to live for the algorithm i don't want to yeah. live for this so let me just focus on what I love to do and which is write songs, make songs and all the other stuff. It's like, I don't have control over. I'll do my best. Right. I'll promote the best that I can. But honestly, like at this point, you know, fans are my publicists. Right. You know, yeah. It's, it's the, and I'm lucky that I was able to be on a label and get exposed to a lot of people, you know, and you know, unfortunately it was, it, didn't get big enough to where I could do it at a level that I would like to, but I'm so very grateful that I can do it in any way that I can. And it's, I'm relying on them to tell their friends, to post it on social media, to do that kind of stuff because, you know, they're my PR. They're, yeah. I don't, 
you know, that's, that's the best that I can do. Yeah. And it's, you know, just, and, and just, you know, working with what you got, like you can't control stuff that's out of your, out of your hands, you know what right. I mean? So. Well, yeah. I think uh, there's, there's a lot of life in Dom and man, you know, and it's funny that I get to talk to you about this of all people, but when, when, when every time I've ever mentioned Domin, like in the, like in a conversation and people know who they are, man, their face lights up. They've got photos with you. Uh, our good yeah. friend, Paul, man, he loves, he's got, I got photos and th that's the only band I can ever say that when people actually know, because, you know, we all have our favorite bands and our favorite moments in music and, Every time Domin gets brought up, man, people just light up when they remember. <laughs> That's awesome. That, yeah. Yeah, it's, it's cool. You know, we met a lot of people, made a lot of connections, made a lot of memories, you know, and I'd like to continue doing that to the best of, that I can with, you know, life the way that it is at the moment. Yeah. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do my best and I try. Whether I fall on my face or succeed, time will tell. Yeah, well, I don't, I don't think you're gonna fall on your face. I think, I think that that whole gothic, the whole goth rock, I mean, it, it's due for a comeback. And just, and just being, you know, man, I don't know. We're, we're over here making music. You know, we put out a new album, and, you know, it's done very well. But then the album's out, and we, and we're just like you, like you said. We you know we didn't want to put out. We put out two singles in a year before the album dropped. You know, you don't want to put out a single every month, and then when the album comes out, nobody really seems to give a shit because they've already heard it. So where do you go from there, you know? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, that was sort of my initial intention with this next album because I put out five songs uh, 2018, 2019, and my initial thought was like, well, I'll just keep putting out a song, a song, a song, a song, and then eventually once I hit 10, I'll put them in as an album. Right. And that was sort of the initial idea. And then, yeah, it was just like, I I wasn't able, you know, like making it sound consistent to be on an album. And, you know, every single song has a slightly different tone because you're recording at a different time yeah. and all that kind of stuff. So it just felt, you know, like not cohesive, you know, in a way that you yeah. want an album to be. Um, but that was initially, you know, what I was going to do. It's just like, okay, I'll just, if singles is a thing now and that's how people want their music, then... But I, I, I don't know if that's the case. It's just like, it's that's the wisdom of the time again, you know, that, that, and that always changes, you know, where it's singles may be a thing for dance music yeah. or certain things. But I think generally with rock music, I'm not sure if singles are still are really the thing. It's a, um, I think it depends on the genre, right? But it's different yeah. strokes, right? So the the our last album that we did, I mean, it like you said, man, it's like a book. It's like, you know, we wanted the we want it to be like moving through the seasons. So yeah. if you played the whole album from front to back, I mean, it's just a big piece of music. Yeah. And it's just like love is gone, man. It it flows. And the kind of music that we make, I don't know if it's single driven. I mean, if if say if you're spirit box or you're you know, you're just doing a three or four minute metalcore song or you know, I mean, you have more room to play because it's more aggressive and not very atmospheric, mm -hmm. I suppose. I mean, it's kind of to the point, right? I mean, um, you know, the, the metalcore, the hard rock, the heavy metal, just straight on bands. I mean, they're kind of to the point mm -hmm. with with bands like Domin or, you know, 69 Eyes, you know, they, they're they going heavy, single heavy lately, but bands like The Becoming, Him, back in the day, um, even bands like mine, October Noir, it, it's, it's kind of hard to do a singles, you know. Yeah, um, it's, yeah, it's, it's weird. Like, I, I tend to like, 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 without without being misunderstood like i like singles in terms of like the type of songs that tend to get right. chosen as singles but it doesn't you know i tend to when i when i tend to get into an artist or something i don't want to just hear one song by them because to me it's always incomplete it's an incomplete look it's like looking at a, a painting like this close you know it's like right. you want to if you if you're in if you want to get into an artist you kind of got to see what you know everything 
like all the different aspects of them. You know what I mean? And I think the album's sort of like a good way to do that. To me, that's more like looking at a piece of art standing where you're where you should stand, so you can kind of take in the whole thing. Yeah, I totally. Agree. Um, looking at like one song, and and I just feel like you, it's not it doesn't do the job of connecting with an artist or, or really identifying identifying like who the artist is or what they're about. Yeah, because you could probably take any song up Love Is Gone by itself, and you go, okay, so is that what Delman sounds like? And someone that knows would be like, well, no, you got to hear this other song. And then so like when you hear all of them, you go like, oh, I get it, you know. Right. It's this. This is what it is over here. Like if you just took my heart in your hands, you would think, you know, Dom and maybe a doom metal band, you know, or something. And if you just yeah, took honestly like the song honestly near the end of the record, you'd be like, oh, they're sort of like a synth poppy band. And if you just took remember, you'd be like, oh, what do they do? Like orchestral love songs? You know what I mean? Like what? Is, right. You sort of have to get the album is the full picture. That, that's yeah. the way that I see it. Yeah. If you took Dark Holiday, they wouldn't know what to think. Yeah. <laughs> you know and. But, and I love that song, and it's just like, but that's not, that doesn't encapsulate the whole identity of, yeah. of the album or the band. Yeah, I said all that to say, I mean, every everything moves so fast now. Like, even in life, uh, you know, you're on social media, you got Reels, you got TikTok, it's, it's fast, 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 instant gratification all the time. I don't know, especially people that are a little bit younger, I don't know how many people sit down and listen to albums anymore. I know that we do. Um, I yeah. see the value in that, but. I think the industry is more led towards just pushing out content, music, content, content. Yeah. Well, that's, you know, contents, it, it's, it is content is king, as they say. Yeah. And um, that's why, like, <clears throat> you know, I remember when I was in Australia and I was talking with, I was thinking of hiring a PR guy. And I was talking with this guy and he was just telling me, like, you know, you got to post like post your, what you're eating and all this kind of stuff. It's like, I don't, I don't really want to post what I'm eating, you know? And he goes like, well, let's think of your favorite artists. Like if they posted what they were eating, would, like you'd probably find that interesting. And I was like, yeah, I guess I get it. Like, I understand like, oh, imagine, right. you know, whoever, like imagine your favorite person and you're like, he's showing you what he's cooking up for breakfast. Yeah, I guess you'd be interested, right? But it was yeah. just, I don't know. I couldn't, I couldn't get on the same page with it because I was like, I don't, First, for one, I don't want my whole life on display. You I know, don't. Like, God, I don't either. I can't stand. I can't stand when people put everything. I mean, because nothing is sacred anymore anyway, right? Uh, well, or at least it, it seems it, to be that way. Yeah, I mean, if if that's how you if that's how you run your life, but that's, right. to me, there are things that are very sacred and very personal and very private, and and not for everybody. Um, yeah. And but the music is. The music is for everybody, and so that's and then that's the part of me that I put out there. Yeah, and I don't have any desire to put up, you know. And 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 I, I don't want to say I fail at doing that, but sometimes I'll like, you know, just sort of questioning my own motivations and well, maybe I'm wrong, you know. Like I'm always willing to accept, like, okay, well, maybe I'm wrong. Maybe I should put up how much, you know, I love white chocolate or something, or maybe how much I like going to Disneyland because then, you know. But then I feel like. What it ends up doing is, you know, because the whole idea of that is you want to get people like finding you and then finding your music. Right. And maybe they find you because you love hot rods or something. And you start posting about your hot rods. I think working on your hot rod. And I just don't know if that if that always translates. Like maybe you might grab a couple of people that go like, oh, wow, this guy posting about his hot rod. And oh, he also does music. Oh, that music's pretty cool. And maybe that's how you capture people. But it's, I don't know. I just. Yeah. I find it hard to be that open with everything, and I and uh, I really and I don't want to live my life on the phone either. Like that's the thing too. It's like I don't yeah, it be, seems to, seems to be reaching a little. Yeah, it's hard to put the phone down because it's so addictive, and there's so much going on all the time, and you sort of get addicted to what the news that's happening and everything. And I'm just I struggle, and I try to go like, okay, I'm going to put my phone in the other room, and I don't right. want to be on it. I don't want to touch it. You know. And it's, you know, it is sort of addictive, but it's, and it's, and like, I'll fail at it from time to time, but I, I'm trying, I'm trying to make it so I don't live on my phone and I'm not living for social media and I'm not living for the algorithms. Yeah. That kind of thing. Well, it's, it's, it's also pretty hard as well. I mean, cause social media is a big part of what you're doing. I mean, as an artist, yeah. it, it's become, and to be fair, I would like to know what Villa Vallo is eating for breakfast every morning, but see, that's the thing that's is. It. Yeah. That's the thing, though, is you'll never know. 
right? Because right. he's not that kind of person. So it just leaves you wondering. And But it's harder for newer bands because, like, obviously he's got the benefit of right. having already been an established band and he's got all these fans and stuff. But if you're like brand new, if you're coming out with a band today. Oh, if you're brand you're new? Get, you're trying to get your first fan or, you know, or grow at all. Like, you you may not have the luxury of not letting people know what you have for breakfast. <laughs> it, yeah, I know. Well, that's true. Yeah. I don't know, you man. You might have to do it because you have to get people's attention all the time. Yeah. To be a new band in this climate and day and age sounds absolutely freaking terrifying. I mean, because, yeah, you, you man, you just really don't honestly have a chance unless you strike gold. Yeah. The, there's everything. It's just oh, so oversaturated, I think. Yeah, well, that's why, like, at the end of the day, you kind of just have to stop paying attention to what everybody else is doing. Just do what you love. Yeah. Just do what you love. Write the songs you want to write. Have fun with your friends. Record songs. Put them out. You know, and maybe maybe one day they'll be appreciated by, you know, maybe you'll be go- dead and gone one day and something will happen and your song will catch fire and people will appreciate it. You know, that's right. what, <laughs> you know, my hope is just like, you know, hopefully someday all these songs will kind of get more of a life out there but in the meantime i'm just gonna do what i love yeah tell me a little bit about the oz tones dominant the oz tones because i i think that came out right right around the pandemic wasn't it the 2022 is when it came out but i was we were released we were doing the single thing we were putting okay. out we, we did eight singles we put out eight singles over the course of, of a year and then in 2022 finally put out the album um, yeah, because see, I didn't even hear, I, I didn't even realize that Domino and the Ostones were a thing until last year. So, mm-hmm. and it's not for not keeping in touch. It just, it, I never saw it. Yeah. But. Well, yeah, you know, that's the thing. You, you, you right. see it, you don't know about it. But, um, but yeah, so when I, um, I moved to Australia in 2016, because that's where my wife lives and moved there and got married and, and, um. You know, and at the time, like, Domin had put out Rise, right? But, you know, it was sort of like it did what it did, but it didn't It didn't make us enough money to, like, go on tour. Right. Or do anything. Like, touring is, is expensive. So we sort of did what we could, which was basically put out a record. Um, and we did, I don't know if we did any shows for that album or not. But, um, so we just put out the album. And so it was sort of, and I was also, just before that came out, I was, like I said, doing anything I could. So I was managing, tour managing, and playing bass with another artist at the time. So in 2013, 14, I was still on the road as a tour manager and as a yeah. bass player for a pop singer. Um, and so, but that sort of was falling apart or not not taking off as as we would hoped. And Dom did their thing, and I was and I and I was. And I had met my wife before she was my wife, met her, and, um, and we started doing the long distance thing. And I was like, you know, this is this is where I need to go. This is what I need to do. This is where my life is is calling me. Yeah. And so I moved to Australia. And so when I got there, initially I was still doing Dom and stuff. And I was trying to get, I was like, well, here I am in Australia. We did a big festival here in 2011. Let me try to bring Dom and over, you know, and we almost got the Lacuna Coil tour down there. Um, but that that didn't happen. So after a while, I started getting you know the itch, and I, and I we were going out to bars and <clears throat> certain things like that. And we saw this rockabilly band play, and, and I thought, oh man, I would love to. I've got all these songs that I had made over the last three or four years that were sort of in that realm, you know, more bluesy, more rockabilly, that kind of thing. I didn't have any sort of outlet for them, and so yeah. I felt like, oh, maybe I'll do separate from Domin, do Christopher Domin over here. And, and, and do that so um found this band that was playing amazing musicians like so good and i just thought like let's get let's let's play gigs let's you know let's make an album let's do all that so while i was there I, that's what we did we and started playing bar gigs and you know mostly covers and then you know like or about half and half half originals half covers yeah and that's what i'll that's what i do with them when i when i'm in Australia, you know, because we'll go back now and then, and okay. you know, at some at some point maybe may move back. So, um, yeah, so did the whole put out eight singles, and then eventually put out an album, and uh, but yeah, it's sort of that just sort of exists 
in Australia. Okay. And I wanted to get them to come over here and, and tour that album. But again, it's so expensive. I mean, yeah. Flight from Australia is insane. So yeah. especially at certain times of the year. But like, I would love to, you know, if they could actually get over here, I'd love to do a tour with Domin and the Austons and do it. Do something that would, like that. That would be cool, man. To be honest, when to so to listen to that record and it's great. It's a great album. I mean, you know, uh, rockabilly isn't really for everybody, but man, there's something for everybody on that album, which which yeah, is so you, so you crazy. So you but, you listen to it? Yo, yeah, yeah. Oh, so let's well, see. It's funny because when I when I play with the guys, we do most of the songs on that album. We do a few Domin songs. So we play Dark Holiday. We play There You Are. Right. Um, if we do anything from the first album, oh, we do a version of Tonight. Um, yeah. So <clears throat> when I play with them, we do some Domin songs, and then we do the songs that we recorded together, and then uh, you know a mixture of covers. Because usually when you're doing the bar gigs, it's like three sets over like three hours, whatever, three 45 minutes. Oh, yeah. Kind of and so I we have to fill that, that time. So, um, but yeah, so we'll, we'll play. But it's funny because initially, you know, when we, when we put the album out over there, we were sort of looking at the Rockabilly Lane for that kind of stuff. And then sort of the same way that I, same thing that I experienced with Domin in a lot of ways, whereas like with Domin, it kind of gets categorized as in the Gothic thing. But then when I started looking at, when we were first together, right before when I was doing it by myself. Yeah. When I was looking at a lot of like the sort of goth venues and the goth things, I was like, oh, well, maybe we're not goth because that's what I'd get. I'd yeah. send my like, want to play a certain club, or there were certain in LA and Hollywood, especially, there were certain like goth nights that would be at these different venues. And they're like, oh, let me try to get, to get the band to play it at these places. And they'd listen to Men Your Misery and go, like, no, it's not really, you guys are like more rock and roll. Like, okay, that's crazy all right so but the same thing would happen with when i was doing the oz tones i was really trying to get on all these sort of like rockabilly festivals yeah and everybody that was sort of in the rockabilly thing was like you guys aren't really rockabilly because rock you know the rockabilly stuff is very like you know i don't know some of it's a bit hokey like it's uh you know wearing bowling shirts and right and wingtip shoes and and it's all about the swing dancing and stuff and for yeah. me it was just like well it's rockabilly and it's like rhythm and it's beat and it's energy. But I get, you know, anybody that was like listening to it would be like, oh, you guys should just be playing rock shows and getting on rock tours and stuff. So I go, fair enough. You know, so sometimes yeah. when you try to go down these sort of like genre things, it's like, I'm, I've always sort of had the curse of being sort of stuck in the middle. You know what I mean? Like between rock and whatever that genre is, rock and rockabilly, rock. And I, definitely, rock. I can definitely yeah. see that. Yeah. And so it was always like, it's just, that's puzzle. crazy. That's crazy for me. I mean, I'm not a rockabilly uh, elitist at all, but when I hear the album, I'm like, this is like straight up rockabilly because That's uh, because in my mind, I'm trying to justify like this is Christopher Dahman doing rockabilly. I'm like, where's the little, where's the the synth and when when's it coming in? But it's not. It's just, but like chasing yesterday sounds nothing like shake. No. I mean, shake is like big band horns. I mean, it's like, what is happening here? But it's you can't deny yeah. how good of a song it is, even if that's not the genre that you like. Yeah. It's it kind of it it grips you. Like Chasing Yesterday is a great song. Well, you know, it's, it's funny. Chasing Yesterday was a dominant song that was going to be on the second record. Well, see, and every time I hear that song, I'm like, man, I wonder where that was supposed to go. Honestly. That was supposed to be on the second album. Yeah. And so that was supposed to be there, but it just wasn't fitting sort of the aggressive vibe that the second album so the second album was supposed to be more aggressive and kind of tongue-in-cheek and like not taking yourself so seriously kind of thing and um and that song was just a bit too melancholy yeah and i wasn't even sure if it was right you know for the oz tones but it was sort of had that kind of rhythm to it and i was like okay like maybe maybe it'll work you know it's a bit has has sounds like the clash mixed with like the cure or something you know kind of thing yeah and um <laughs> but yeah you know I was like, well, let me do it with these guys, and I think it sounds cool. And that whole album, the, the approach that I took with that album is I wanted something that didn't, because you know, you were asking me about like, what do you think of music these days, and right. that kind of thing. And one of the things that frustrates me about a lot of, like, especially sort of like in the active rock category, 
I guess they call it active rock, like hard rock category. Who knows? Who knows what they call? It's, it's it's all sounds kind of the same. And yeah. It's because they're all using sort of like the same drum plugins and like same amp modules and stuff like that. And so it's, you know, I don't want to name names, but you could like. Right. You'd, you'd be like, oh, that drum sound sounds exactly like the drum sound on like ten other tracks on this, whatever. Yeah. And so when I was doing the Ozstones album, I thought like I just wanted to do a very like minimal in terms of my approach probably not minimal for somebody else it's not like just me on acoustic guitar right but it's but minimal in the sense that like i didn't want a wall of sound i didn't want a wall of guitars and honestly the drummer jot is so good he's very much like like a mitch mitchell from Jimi hendrix type player like if you listen to Jimi hendrix at all which i'm a big fan the drumming is as interesting as the guitar playing Mm -hmm. and the flow of the drumming and it's just i was like no no gates on his drums like everything wide open you know and to me like his drumming made those songs way better and when i was approaching it i was like okay i don't want a wall of sound i'm going to put the acoustic guitar over here the electric guitar over there and you know the bass up the middle yeah. and let the drums breathe and try not to have too much going on so that you can just hear everything so i was sort of approaching it like a doors record or a or like a Hendrix record or something from like the late sixties, early seventies. I wanted that to have it that like raw sound to it. Yeah. But I couldn't I couldn't fully escape from the keyboards and stuff. So there is some synth layered in here and there. Like the first song, Let's Do This Thing, has chimes and Chasing Yesterday has got some choirs in the background a little bit. Um because I just can't help myself. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, what was the fan? What was the fan response? I mean, because I, I know there's still, I know there's still a Domin fan base out there. I see it all the time. What was the fan for, response like to the Ostones? Um, for Domin fans, some of them were just like, "Oh, that's cool, you're doing that thing. Like, let me know when you do another Domin record." You know. <laughs> and then, oddly enough, I I read a comment on YouTube for the song called "No Destination," and they were like, and the, and they were a Domin fan, and they said, "This is my favorite thing you've ever done." Yeah. Like, oh, that's awesome. So that, that made me feel good to be like, oh, here's a Domin fan that knows knows me as the Domin music, you know, darker right. stuff. And they hear this kind of no destination bluesy country kind of song and they think it's the best thing that I've ever done. So it's it's a mixed bag, like like yeah. these things. Yeah. So well, an album I'm really proud of though. I love it. And like, you know, You Can't Love was a song on Men Your Misery, and I was like, I repurposed it for the Ozstones. Yeah. Yeah, you you totally t- you took it a different direction in there, and it was awesome. Yeah. Uh, I the the Ozdons didn't take any time to grow on me. You know how some some things you're like, well, you know, I really like this band, so let me give it a few listens. I just kind of mm-hmm. saw it for what it was, and it's it's awesome. And I'm not I don't really venture too much out. I mean, of course, I love Johnny Cash and you know the older style country. But um, well, that was a big influence. Like, yeah, that's huge influence. Yeah, and I love I love Unknown Henson too, even though he's kind of ridiculous. But mm-hmm. but you know, I mean the the bluesy the bluesy stuff I'm definitely on board with, so it works. Yeah, well I'm glad you dig it because yeah, it's, it's it's an album I'm very proud of, and I, I hopefully I can make another one because I've got a bunch of songs. It's it's <clears throat> it's really just like I need somewhere to put these songs. <laughs> yeah, and I love and I love the guys in the band. Like I generally when I was moving back here, I was sort of sad a little bit because I was like, oh, we were just starting to get some good momentum going and we're building a name for ourselves and and that kind of thing over there um so i'm i'm looking forward to to being with them again and, and making another album because i had i have so much fun with those guys the guys are like the coolest funniest most yeah. laid-back aussie guys you can imagine so yeah that 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 is cool i've got i've got a couple of questions man so like sure your all-time favorite bands what are we looking at here that's a good question. Um, so, you know, sometimes when you when you discover a band at a certain age, they always become like they're sort of forever ingrained as your favorite kind of thing. Yeah, like him and Dom and bands like that for me. Yeah. 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 There you go. So, like when I was little, you know, when I was like, I don't know, seven or eight, like I was exposed to Kiss and ACDC. So those are my like initial bands that i loved in rock music and especially yep. as a little kid kiss their theatrics everything and to this day i love kiss um not so much a fan of like the kind of like off makeup years except for the album revenge 
but um, like basically everything from album one to including the elder and creatures of the night, like big Kiss fan. Like, I'm, a, I'm, I'm like a Kiss geek nerd. So if anybody wants to start talking about Kiss with me, I will like, I'll be geeking out with you for hours. I'm sure there's um, some podcast for that. I, there probably is. Um, and then a little bit older, nine or 10, I started getting into, and I, had, I had the benefit of having an older brother who's like five, six, five and a half years older than I am. So he was getting into music in high school when I was a little kid and I was getting exposed to all that stuff. Yeah. So like when Master of Puppets came out and the first Danzig record, like I was getting exposed to that right when it was coming out. So Metallica and Danzig became my new favorite bands. Um, and then when I got a little bit older, when Nirvana came out, a huge Nirvana fan, still a Nirvana fan. Yeah. Um, and then right around just after Nirvana um, is when I discovered Typo and Life of Agony. And those were like, and I saw them play together twice, which was awesome. Like the first time I saw Typo was at the Whiskey, small little thing. I remember they were like, they had a U-Haul for uh, like a band van with their right. gear in it. So there was a U-Haul parked out in front of the Whiskey on the Sunset Strip. And it was Life of Agony, it was some band I didn't know, and then Life of Agony and Typo Negative. And I could have sworn, they'd, I've talked to Johnny Kelly, but he says it wasn't him, but I could have sworn that Sal was doing double duty for both bands, but Johnny says that he was playing at the time. So I don't know. I could have sworn it was Sal doing the drums for both bands on that gig. But um, anyway, getting back to it. So Life of Agony and Typo were yeah. my favorite bands at the time. And then from there, after that, it was Rammstein and Depeche Mode. So those, that's sort of like, those are my, my larger Mount Rushmore of, because Mount Rushmore's only got four heads. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That, it's hard to narrow it down to four, but it was always like, Kiss and Metallica, Danzig, Typo, Depeche Mode, Rammstein. Those are like my, in yeah. terms of rock, in terms of rock music, those are like my favorite bands. That's awesome. And I, I think will... that, that's basically what comes across in the music. Like, yeah. That's what I was about to say. I always, I always like to know like your influences and your favorites because then I can kind of see where they come in. And I think that that's about sums it up. The top two are probably Typo and Depeche Mode. You mix yeah. those two bands together, you pretty much get Domin with a little bit of Danzig, you know. Yeah. Yeah, man. Well, you know, yeah, Typo, dude, they ju they just don't they don't fit in a box. And I guess Domin doesn't either, right? Even every you know everything you do, it's like, well, it, it's this or it's that. But that's the same I mean, way Typo. Is, is, so. And I and I could geek out with you on Typo all day too, because um, they're yeah, like I'm. A huge fan of that band. I actually got to open up for them. Really? Um, way, way back. Shouldn't have been able to. Right. <laughs> I was in another band and I had just started my band. And the other band had a sort of like a fan base. And I was like, when I started my band, I was like, oh, we got the same fan base. Like, because they were looking for local openers. Yeah. And so I got to open up for them. Um, I can't remember what tour it was. Must have been like around ninety nine two thousand, and uh, that was way back when, yeah, a long time ago. And uh, yeah, and I, I remember seeing Peter Steele walk down the stairs from the dressing room, and he patted me on the head, <laughs> and just talked to Johnny and um, and Kenny for a little while, and that was like a dream come true. But it was like we were we weren't ready. Like we was that was very very early. We shouldn't have been able to do that show, but yeah, I, I'm glad I got to say that we did. But um, it's funny, like. I'm like a huge fan of that band and it's like for me when I listen now like listen back like I really like Dead Again and that album had to grow on me for a while but to me if I'm if I put on Typo right now I'm likely to put that record on which is interesting because it's not what people think of like everybody either says October Rust or or Bloody Kisses yeah and uh and I love those albums but I and for a while like Life is Killing Me was my favorite I really really like that one a lot um, Nettie for me is like one of the most perfect typo tracks there is. It is. Um, but uh, but yeah, I loved that they 
had a sense of humor about things. I love that they, you know, that Peter was very personal in his in his, in, in his subject matter. <clears throat> but the thing that I loved about Dead Again is I felt like his personality finally came out. Um, when you listen to Dead Again and you hear all like the mon maniacal laughter through it and like that kind of stuff to me, like that was Peter yeah. being mo his, his most sort of authentic self. Um, not to say that the other stuff wasn't authentic, but it's just, um, yeah. Yeah. Well, that again, his personality comes, comes through in Dead Again that I really appreciate as an as like an artist. Yeah, well, Dead Again was a different album. I mean, they they had swapped labels and the whole sound yeah. was different than anything else. So it's just raw. I mean, yeah. it was like, yeah, it is great. I, you know, I'm I'm more apt to put on Life Is Killing Me and just listen to, you know, the the middle tracks and maybe mm -hmm. Anesthesia, you know, and just yeah. just kind of. I don't, you know, I don't listen to a whole lot of typo lately. I, I think I burnt myself out on it a few <laughs> years back. Too much typo. But, but um, every now and then, see, I'm that way with him, like Villa mm -hmm. Vallo and him and Mies and Gas and man, I just I go on and on and people get tired of hearing me talk about it. But that, you know, but a lot of people that I'm around, typo is that is their that is their peak and that's kind of yeah. where I'm at with him. Gotcha. Which of course, you know, and him admittedly, they're like, oh, we just we want to be Black Sabbath and typo negative, you know. Yeah. So if it wasn't for him, I don't think I would have found typo negative way back when. But yeah, it's funny how um, like I can't remember where I saw this. It was someplace recently where somebody was saying that they liked typo, but they hated the Beatles. And like I was, I've become sort of like a Beatles late bloomer. Yeah. I was never into the Beatles, sort of always hated the Beatles. And I actually only started liking them, I want to say, like, three or four years ago. And when I listen to them now, I go like, oh, this is where Typo gets all their stuff. You know what I mean? Like, you can just, you listen to it and you can hear it and you go like, oh, of course. Like, you can, when you, if you get, you know, Pink Floyd and the Beatles, you get Typo. Yeah. With a more modern sound, obviously. Um, you know, but it's funny how how you can hear the influences of those bands and stuff. And you know, I guess you can like, you know, the result of that marriage of bands and yeah. not like the initial ones, but um, you get it, you do get an appreciation for it when you kind of go back and find out who influenced them. Yeah, there's, yeah, that's funny that you mentioned the Beatles. Cause I mean, I, I gave it a shot, you know, when I was younger, I gave it a shot <laughs> when I was too young. You know, I think, I think you just either would have had to been there or you really have to be, you really have to sit with an open mind on it. But maybe, maybe I'll give them another shot. I mean, if you listen to, I don't, I don't know if this is the proper title, but well, my guitar gently weeps. I don't know if you know that song. Yeah. But I mean, that song is so cool and like heavy and goes different places and stuff. Um, yeah. So I mean, like I, I wouldn't call myself a huge Beatle fanatic, but right. I have started finally now just now like i were really starting to appreciate them the same thing with neil young i was never a neil young fan i sort of i always found like crosby still is in nash and young and, and neil young they just like boring like to me when i was growing up like if it didn't have balls like damn if it, if it wasn't you know big and epic mm -hmm. or like you know had choirs of keyboards in it and stuff i was just like oh this is lame it's boring and and it's funny my wife turned me on to neil young because she's Neil Young fan. I remember flying home on the plane from Australia after visiting her once <clears throat> and listening to Heart of Gold. And I was like, it's sort of all of a sudden the appreciation, appreciation of Neil Young hit me. And, yeah. and listening to them, I can go like, oh, I, now I, and I can hear how that influenced Typo. But it took a long time. Like I was never into the sort of, I've become a lot more open-minded musically in the last, I don't know, four or five years, I would say. Stuff that yeah. I never thought I would listen to or appreciate all of a sudden. Like, I feel like I'm appreciating everything. It's weird. I'm loving music more than I ever have. Yeah, I, I, I can. I feel you on that. I can I can kind of say the same about myself, you know, where you want to be like, yeah, you know, screw this. N never give anything a chance. And you just kind of come back around to it. So. Yeah, I mean, that's and that was sort of like an inspiration for the Austin's album, too, is because I was starting to listen to the Beatles and Neil Young and those kinds of things. And like those albums and the doors, like. I mean, I've always been a Doors fan, but um, those albums are so like, they don't need a lot. 
yeah there's just there's a vibe and the sound is just raw and like yeah it, it's it's so cool like i find myself listening to music from like the 60s and 70s now more than anything modern i'm going back to like i'll still put on a hendrix record i'll still put on a doors record and now i'll put on you know harvest moon from neil young or you know a beatles record and enjoy it fully yeah i was going to ask you if there's if there's any newer ish bands that you've found or that you've been listening to because so, i just tend to go back to all the old stuff just i yeah. just but i was gonna i was wondering if if there's been any new bands that have come across your radar uh like oh man this is great you know everybody talks about sleep token i'm like eh. uh-huh. it just ain't really it's just not really my thing man but yeah you know, everybody's different and you know you find you find the music whenever you find it whenever it hits you so i haven't found a lot in the straight up rock world yeah um that i can think of off the top of my head i'm sure there i'm sure there is one or two here and there where i was like oh that was cool but in terms of stuff that i think is great and actually love nothing i can't really think of anything in the world of rock there is a band it's just two brothers they're called the ruin brothers and they're sort of like a more they're kind of like a a noir country like a, a dark right um folky kind of thing i i listened their newest album that came out love it listen to it over and over again it's not in the rock world it's 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 its own thing so that's the ruin brothers um my wife's a big fan of cannons which is like a dream pop kind of thing and i've okay. seen them live a few times cannons is a you know not in the rock world but you know i yeah. like them i think they're cool i find them interesting um but yeah, I mean, I wish I wish there was. <laughs> yeah, I'm gonna I'm gonna have to send you our new album, and you're gonna have to dissect it for me and see what you think about it. Yeah, I look forward to it. But I mean, I, yeah. I guess that's sort of like the motivation for still to do music, because every once in a while, you know, like you see somebody or hear somebody that's so good, and you go like, oh, why do I even bother? <laughs> you know. <laughs> but uh, but I think you know, I think that's sort of maybe one of the motivations for wanting to do another record and and keep doing music too, is because you're not really hearing anything out there that you want to hear yeah you know i like i know some people will be like oh i can't listen to my own music but that's not the case for me like i li- I listen to Domin. yeah yeah well that's that's like our our it took me you know you're it takes a little bit of time like after the album comes out right because you're so close to it you can't stand you can't physically stand to hear it another time but with a little right. bit of space because we yeah. did it we we were in in new orleans and did an interview and there's and I think it was a little too close to when the album would come out. And they're like, you know, how are you loving the new album? I'm like, I haven't even listened to it. Just because, <laughs> just because you've heard it over and over yeah. and you're, you know, but now, I mean, it didn't take long. It may be two or three weeks, but I started to listen to it and go through it as a whole. How long were you guys in the studio for recording it? Uh, we put out a, put out a single and... Uh, the like November of 22, I think, and then had some issues, didn't know if we were going to continue <clears> on, <throat> kind of some inner tor- turmoil in the band with the singer, but pretty much, man, I'd say, I'd say we wrote that album in six months. I mean, six or seven months all together. There was some spaces in between, but when we, when it, when the writing started, it just didn't stop. So... Yeah. But much like typo, we have long songs and you get the atmosphere and so. Well, yeah. If, if you're if you're if the recording time is, is a lot and you're sort of exposed to the songs, you know, yeah. maybe more than you'd like to be. It's sort of it can be hard to listen to it for a while. But yeah, it doesn't take too long before you can kind of listen to it with fresh ears again. Yeah. Well, you have to like clean cleanse your pal clean your palate maybe like cleanse. Yeah. Kind of get it out and get away from it for a minute it's like um going back to what you're saying about um you know like new things i listen to like i still go back and listen to frank sinatra all the time man i've got his greatest hits and it's just yeah. it's so good it's, it's some people may not appreciate it i don't know but i i've always loved sinatra um especially his sort of later year stuff like it's really interesting because his career sort of had two two um 
two periods. And he was like the one where he was like really young and you kind of hear his voice is really young. And then, you know, I think it was in the sixties sort of when he kind of had a revival of his career yeah. and just the, the character that he developed in his voice and like Nelson Riddle was one of his arrangers and the, the, the string arrangements and all that kind of stuff. It's just amazing. And his, the way that he, um, his rhythm, the way that he, he does his flow with his, his vocals and everything. It's just, nothing's like it. Like one of my, I would say in my top five favorite songs of all time that I've, of, of any genre or across anything is um, in the wee small hours of the morning. Yes. I yeah. Know if you know yeah. that song, if you listen to that in headphones and you just basically hear these subtle strings and the little chimes and his voice sounds like it's speaking right into your ear, like that, it to me is perfection. That song I'm gonna, is amazing. I'm gonna out myself as a, a pop, a poppy type guy. Man, there is a cover of John Mayer with Chris Bode on. It's on YouTube, and he does in the wee small hours. It's just the guitar. Oh, really? It's the jazz and it's the trumpet. That is the most. It is perfect, dude. It is perfection. It's oh, just to check that out because John that Mayer, one of my favorite songs of all time. Dude, John Mayer that. and Chris Bode doing that song just on YouTube or whatever on like oh, a late night show. It is so good. Huh? I'm, I'm writing that down. <laughs> hey, John, Hey, John Mayer's all right with me, man. He's done some good stuff. Yeah. Well, you know, it's people always see him as like kind of the pop guy from back in the day, but he's still going real strong and he's, I feel like yeah. he's gotten <clears throat> grown as an artist and yeah, I mean, I don't listen too much to him, but every time, like if he does, he's really interesting on in interviews and um, anything that he does, it's like, yeah. I can't knock it. I can't. It just. Well, he's an amazing yeah. guitar player. Like holy. Hell. Oh hell yeah! It's the deep tracks for me, man. It's the deep tracks that it's the thing. Well, you know, you hear his hit, but you didn't hear all the other songs on the album, and you're just like, wow, it's good stuff. I'll have to check it out. I haven't I haven't done my due diligence with John Mayer, but I'm totally down to. Like I, I love yeah. finding stuff that I, you know, discovering new stuff, new stuff for me. Yeah. Well, when he came, when he first came out, I was a young guy, and I'm like. Hey, my parent, my dad will get me this CD at Walmart, so let's check it out. You know, let's dissect. Oh, cool. So. <laughs> <laughs> but man, back in the day, the I was, was in, I was into the emo stuff too, man. All the Victory Records and um, you know all the Bayside's and the Hawthorne Heights and Silverstein's and stuff like that. I never got into the emo stuff, and it's funny because people sometimes categorize Dom as emo because I got the devil lock. Yeah. And be like, oh, you're an emo band. I was like, I never, because I never liked the emo stuff. I always went, I went from like you know, new metal and stuff like corn and things like that to, you know, going into typo and everything like that. Yeah. And so I, it's funny, like nowadays I can appreciate my chemical romance. Back then I did not, I did not. Like when they first came out, I was not a fan of that kind of thing. I can feel you on that. That's the only band like, that I wasn't a fan of. Well, and, and now, but if I listen back to their albums now, I go like, oh, very cool. I dig it. I've, I've yeah. listened to it. It's awesome. Um, but a lot of the bands that came out at that time, I was just like, with my AirPods dropping, I might see if I can. Can you hear me still? Yeah. Okay. I got gotcha. you. This one's working. Um, okay. But uh, but yeah, so like, I think a lot of times it was the voice, the singing of a lot it of the bands that I didn't like because it was very like whiny. And I liked the male voices. I liked the Jim Morrison's, the Glenn Danzig's, the Peter Steele's. I liked, you know, yeah, the, the baritone voices. I didn't like anything that sounded too like, you know, fifteen-year-old kid whining about, I don't know, not getting well, to stay out till midnight or something. Well, I <laughs> was, I was that fourteen, fifteen-year-old kid at the time, so it was like it. Plus, I mean, I didn't. You identified. Yeah, I was, That's you know, cool. and I was like, man. Life sucks, and then here I am. I'm a I'm a an adult, and I'm like, wow, dude. I really didn't. It really wasn't that bad back then. <laughs> yeah, fair enough. Yeah, no. Yeah. Sometimes it's timing. Yeah. You know? Certain songs, music hits you at a certain time in your life, and you just yeah. Yeah. It's true. Well, man. So let's talk about this Dama newsletter. You've got you've got some big stuff coming up, and you've got some things in the works. Um. Yeah. Maybe putting together a new band. Um, yeah, so um, I would like to perform again. Um, I, I miss it when I was playing with the Oz Tones. It's like one of the things I miss. Um, yeah. And it's it's just 
I don't know. It's it's a way to connect with people. It's a way to to make new fans and to get your music out there. Um, so I would like to perform again, but you know, over the years, it's it's you would know this. It's not easy being in a band, especially if you're doing it like full time. You know, no. unless it's unless you're like going like that. I was always one of the like you know they always say like oh would you, what advice would you give yourself now back you know back then what you know now kind of thing. And it was my own advice was always like I should have told myself don't stop because once you stop, it's hard to get that train going again because everyone's got different lives. Yeah. Um, but you know, looking back on it now, it was meant to be. You know, if I if I hadn't stopped and I was just going, I probably wouldn't have moved to Australia and married my wife. Yeah. You know what I mean? So it's all it all works out the way that it's supposed to, I believe. But um, but you know, yeah, I would like to to perform again and unfortunately like all the guys are doing different things you know like keyboard player and bass player billy and constantine like they're out of music completely um so um cameron's doing his own thing and <clears throat> he's up in northern california so i have to find new people that want to get on stage and i don't want it to be good you know what i mean like right probably the thing that's not is interesting for people to like to know about was like you know we, we i thought we did a good job on stage had a good stage presence a good performance and stuff and that wasn't just natural that was us like you know back in 2005 playing in my mom's living room taking videotape of ourselves and going ah, you look dumb when you do that um yeah you make that face while you're playing that like looks really bad you know like that kind of stuff like we critiqued ourselves to get to us to a point where like we were solid on stage and so i can't just get like the dude that can play the notes that's down the street who's not oh, a good yeah. performer you know what i mean like i gotta get people who know how to be on stage know the vibe you know that whole thing so it's you gotta learn how to find people that can play and also people that can perform and and ideally you know but they love the music and they're down to pay for their own flight somewhere right. <laughs> because i don't have the money to to like you know if, if i was bigger if i was like you know like marilyn mance is, is his own thing i'm sure he's got the money to give his players salaries and stuff and bring for sure over. yeah i don't have that luxury so i'm literally going to people going like you know do you want to leave your wife and kids for the weekend <laughs> <laughs> you know to to go do or you know a string of shows or you know run up this coast or run up that coast that, that would be sort of what i would be looking at so yeah yeah i need to find people that can play that can perform and that are willing to sacrifice a bit of their personal lives to to do it you know yeah so i think it'll happen search is on you know i've had i've I, had a couple of people hit me up since that came out yeah don't want to say anything yet but no you, no. Might, you might know you might know one of them or two of them who knows okay but uh but yeah so so we'll see like I, i'm i'm optimistic i text dustin i was like hey man you get on guitar, I'll go do drums. Let's leave. Let's just leave life for a little while, you know. <laughs> yeah, because it wouldn't be like a huge commitment, like because I I've got yeah. my own life, you know what I mean. So I'm not, I I unless we got like an opportunity where it was like, oh, you know, Billy wants to take you out on tour. Okay, I'll go. But if it's just right. me and I'm just setting up shows, it's probably going to be like four days here, four days there, a weekend here, like that kind of stuff. So. You know, to, to be honest, it's not like a huge commitment. The only commitment is learning the songs and, you know, parting with some cash to get to where yeah. we need to be. Yeah, and realistically, I mean, that that's how we do shows too. A weekend here, uh, this little fest, this this festival, you know, just one off and a string of shows here. Because we all, I mean, we all have our own lives. We have to, you know, we have our own finances. You music does not pay the bills anymore i don't no. i it's hard for me to think of a time where music could have paid the bills i mean i guess there's always that chance right but being even realistic when we were touring, even when we were touring we weren't making any money we were all living it with our parents or living with you know yep. in situations where we didn't have to pay rent and that's why we could do it and any money that we made just went right back into the band like i you know uh, that's i paid for the van I paid for the trailer, you know, any sort of like advances that we got, we just put right back into the business essentially right. to, to grow it and to keep it going, you know? So yeah, no one, no one was making any money. 
you know, I think the guys were getting maybe a hundred bucks a month, to be honest. Like that's, yeah. that's it, was nothing. it was nothing. So hundred bucks a month and like per diems anywhere between 15 and 20 bucks a day while we were out on the road. That's mm-hmm. what we all lived on. And, you know, you try to like eat cheap as shit to, <laughs> so that you can save up your per diems right. every day. Cause you know, and then hopefully that would sustain you for a little while when you got home. Man. Yeah. It's just the reality of, of music, you know, like so certain people, you know, if you're at a certain level, obviously it's really great, but yeah. you know, it's funny. Cause one of the things that COVID did, I don't know if it was just COVID, but I remember before COVID every once in a while, you know, you watch like rock news stuff come out and yeah. like, you always find like, Oh, this band that is that you think is like fairly successful, even if it's in a small way. And you learn like, oh, their guitar players leaving the band, oh, their drummers leaving the band to focus on other things or to start a family or whatever it is. Because you realize like, not easy to kind of like live, like make, you know, you're you're choosing, if you're you're doing that, you're choosing like a different type of life. And if you want any sort of like normal life, normal relationships, that kind of thing, it's not very conducive to that. Absolutely. I know. It is it's tough, which is why, I mean, that's not really, in a lot of bands, it's not feasible to do that, you know? Yeah. It's. And, you know, the thing is, like, I don't want to come across as, like, complaining or whining about it. Like, you know, like when people talk about social media or the way Spotify is now in music, it's like, yeah, I could complain, but it's just like, it is what it is. Right. And it's just like, so what? You know? Like, yeah. <laughs> I don't want to, like, come across as, like, mopey about it. It's like, whatever. Right. I'm just gonna, I'm gonna do what I love, and it's Domin may be looked at as a passion project now, as opposed to like a full time gig. It is what it is. I'm still, I'm a happy person. You yeah. Know, like I'm, I'm all good. Yeah. <laughs> I wish we it can't, was different. You know, but. Right. Well, we, we can't change the way the things are. We just have to adapt, yeah. right? I mean, you just adapt and keep growing and have fun. Yeah, exactly. And that's if it's not fun, don't do it. You know, if, yeah. if it's too hard, don't do it. You know, in terms of not not if it's too hard, like, but if it's too hard to the point to where it's, you know, if the sacrifices that you're making aren't worth what you're doing, then then don't do it. Yeah. You know, hopefully you've got, you know, su- support from either your partner or your, you know, your family or your friends or your bandmates enough to where it's fun and you want to do it. And when it's not fun anymore, you stop. Yeah. And, you know, there's plenty of times when I've thought about stopping and it's just... I don't know. There's just something in you that kind of just goes, you know, yeah. you don't feel the same. Like if it I, won't, there's, it there's won't like couple, let you. Yeah. Like, well, there's a couple of things that like, if I stop doing, I get sort of down. One of them is going to the gym. Like I'm in the gym six days a week. If I don't, if I'm not doing that, if, we're, if we're, I never can't even remember the last time I had a week off, but if any sort of days pass, I start going like, I'm not, I don't feel right. I don't feel myself. And the same thing with music. If I'm not, if I don't get myself, playing guitar or recording something or writing lyrics or doing something after a few days, I'll start to feel a bit gloomy. Yeah. And so just get getting into it kind of makes me feel, keeps my equilibrium. You know, I mean, it makes me feel normal. Uh, absolutely. I totally understand. Yeah. Well, man, dude. So let's hope, let's hope for some, some uh, new news from Dom and let, you know, let's hope that we get this together. So where where are you based out of? You're based in Atlanta, or I am in Mobile, Alabama. Mobile, Alabama. Okay, cool. Yeah, and the band the band is out of Pensacola, Florida. So. Gotcha. It's not too far from me, but you know. Yeah. We kind of. How far of a drive is that for you to? to so it's that? about an hour. Oh, that's not bad. No, I that's easy. <laughs> yeah. I thought you were gonna say like four or five hours or something. No, 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 no. It's that's just right cool. down. Yeah, that's awesome. I mean, yeah, that that's totally doable. I used to when when I was playing in other bands and stuff, I'd be driving an hour and a half, two hours, like a couple of days a week. Yeah. Just to just to get to rehearsals and stuff like that. So man. Luckily I don't have to do that. But keep it keep it up, man. Just yeah. Keep it yeah. keep it going and keep having fun with your friends. That's what it, that's what it's really about. I mean, like I'm more of a collaborative person, to be honest. Like I I liked being in a band. I've always wanted to be in a band. Like Kiss was sort of like my, my I, iconic thing to always want to be. Like I always thought it'd be so cool to be in a band where four people sang and each person had their sort of like identities and that kind of thing. Like that was sort of my 
my big goal. But for whatever reason, like every band member I got, like God bless them, they're they're great, but none of them could sing. <laughs> Very even backup vocals was really really hard. So um, you know Billy could shout here and there, um, and so it was, I was always like oh, I never had that. You know I was but, but even in writing like. For me, my favorite stuff is stuff where like somebody else would write like a, a tune or like come up with something and then I would yeah. take it and turn it into a song. So I always appreciated more being in a collaborative environment, even though like, you know, like this next album, I think is going to be all songs fully written just by me, um, like my heart, your hands or something like that. But um, but yeah, like I, I, en I enjoy the collaboration, you know, so if I, if ideally I'd be able to find a band that would actually be able to contribute as well a little bit too, but um, yeah. we'll see what happens. But, you know, if, if I can't, that's all good too. I'm happy to do what I'm doing now. And Yeah. Well, I mean, all I would say is trust the process of what you've done thus far. I mean, yeah, it doesn't, I can't say it, especially the first album and even the EP and, all the other ones, I mean, I can't see you changing too much, man. Just keep doing what you're doing. I think, I think it'll be, I think it'll be a good thing, man. And I'm sure, because when I saw, when I saw the newsletter and the Facebook post, I'm like, man, there's gonna be people jumping on that. So it's gonna be I hope a cool so. thing, you know. And, and I hope all those people are gonna be my PR people and let other people know, because yeah, yeah I, mean, I, I, I don't know how much I'm gonna do in terms of marketing and promotion, but I'm gonna make it. I'm gonna put it out. You know, hope for the best. Yeah. Well, Chris, man, it was great talking to you, man. We're gonna, I'm going to wrap this up, I guess, and let you get back to it. But it was great to talk to you and let yeah, everybody. Thanks for having me on and, and uh, appreciate it talking to you and keep in touch, man. Yeah, absolutely. Look forward to listening we'll to your stuff. Yeah, we'll definitely keep in touch, man. And shout out like Domin on Facebook. Domin.com is the best place to, to find your stuff. Yeah, I, I tend to update that even though like for a while it was pretty dead domin.com is going to be the place where i put everything initially like even the domin newsletter and stuff i had posted on yeah. domin.com like the day after new year's and but i didn't send out the newsletter and post it on socials till weeks later so yeah i was trying to make sure the website's the the primary place to go for news and info awesome man well thank you so much for being here with me and i will catch you on the other end of this interview and i appreciate it man awesome thanks dude see ya